Just biochar is quite a new subject. I hope I'm not going to be too simplistic for some of you, but I want to sort of share how I got to the point where I saw biochar as a climate mitigation tool more than a renewable energy play, although it has that option as well. I was born uh, in Nebraska, in the middle of that green part of the map, uh, on a farm that my great-grandfather carved out of virgin prairie. When he plowed that land, it had about 100 tons of carbon per hectare in the ground. By the 1930s, that had diminished greatly. Then tractors came in, oil was 10 cents a barrel, they plowed deeper and took even more carbon out of the ground. And after the war, nitrate fertilizers pretty much knocked the last bit of stuffing out of the soil and it's now about five tons per hectare. So if you'd looked at that land on a Google map in 1885, it would have been black. Now if you look at it, it's a sort of pale beige color. It's, it's got no carbon left in it. Where did that carbon go? Into the atmosphere. Up till 1980, half of all the greenhouse gas increase since 1850 came from land use change, from deforestation and agriculture. Agriculture still is maintaining its role as a major carbon emitter, but it hasn't been able to keep up with industrialization. The inevitable result of all of this was that the soil structure broke down. Without carbon to hold soil together, without it to retain moisture in the soil, the soil disintegrated, and that was the result. Dust bowl, huge storms of dust, year after year, smothered the United States. Uh, the Roosevelt wanted to bring in the Civilian Conservation Corps to try and do something about it. Uh, the Congress said it was too socialistic. Uh, but they timed the presentation to Congress on the day that a dust cloud was tracking towards Washington. And when it hit Washington, Congress approved the Civilian Conservation Corps, which led to three million men planting 10 billion trees across Oklahoma, Nebraska, Kansas, and North Texas to restore structure to the soil. Unfortunately, that didn't last very long because World War II came along, Britain's food production fields became, Europe's food fields became battlefields, and the price of wheat shot up and farmers went in and took out the trees, and it's still a pretty fragile environment to this day. That provoked the uh, establishment of the Soil Association. Eve Balfour had written a book called Living Soil, in 1944, they didn't have as much knowledge of soil science as we have now, but the Soil Association was established to try and prevent that sort of thing happening in Europe. But ICI won the debate in 1947. The Agriculture Act brought in fertilizer at ten subsidies at 10 shillings a bag, and chemicals won the day. Agriculture has problems. We're losing hundreds of millions of acres of land a year that is salinated from overuse of chemicals or is just eroded and blown away. In 2005, the leading uh, international, governmental, agribusiness, everybody who had an interest in agriculture got together and said something needs to be done. And they set up the International Assessment for Agricultural Science and Technology for Development, IAASTD. They appointed 400 agronomists, leading agronomists in the world, and they published their report under the leadership of Bob Watson, who's currently the chief scientist at DEFRA, to say what they saw as the future of agriculture globally. And the results upset Monsanto and Syngenta, who had helped to choose these uh, experts, because their results didn't fit with their policy. And what they said was, we have to put human health first, we have to revisit the Green Revolution, recognize that it created more problems than it solved, and that genetic engineering is just going to exacerbate some of those problems or prolong the agony. We have to do something now to protect our agricultural capital, which is soil. 
and we have to reward farmers who prevent climate change, who do something about it. The Food and Agriculture Organization talks about climate smart agriculture, which is adaptation because climate is getting drier and hotter. It's about mitigation, about how can agriculture be part of the solution to climate change rather than part of the problem, and how can productivity be maintained. And there's an interesting comparison. An industrial farmer uses 12 calories of fossil fuel to produce a calorie of food. And then that goes, if it's fed to chickens or cattle, it becomes much more inefficient because those calories are used to produce meat that uh, has a lower calorie food value. Organic farmers aren't that much better. They still use six calories of fossil fuel to produce a calorie of food. And a man with a hoe can produce 20 calories of food with only one calorie of energy. So arguably is 120 times more efficient in calorific terms than an organic farmer and 240 times more efficient than an industrial farmer. But we run out of men with hoes if we try to feed the whole planet in that way. The Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania has done, is in the 30th year of a trial. They've published their results every year. And they've shown that organic farming uses 45% less energy, roughly the figure in the previous slide, that average yields match conventional, that you know, a well-managed organic system shows increasing yields year on year, and they've been doing it for 30 years, but also that in dry years, you get particularly good benefits. And on top of that, the bonus is carbon sequestration of up to one ton per hectare per annum. That's, that's recalcitrant carbon. That's carbon that stays in the soil. That's humic acid. That's the kind of carbon that doesn't easily disappear. Now, if you extrapolate it from that, this is a bit silly, but if the whole world went organic, and you, the Rodale results applied, we could sequester six gigatons of carbon dioxide a year. Can we do better than that? And the argument of biochar is yes, we can. What is biochar? Basically, it's charcoal. It's produced by the exact same pyrolysis techniques that are used to produce charcoal. The difference is that those techniques are modified to produce charcoal that is ideal for agricultural use. And that means it's produced at low-ish temperatures. Pyrolysis starts at 390 degrees, and we try to keep it below 500. Charcoal makers may go up to six or 700. Gasification systems that have charcoal as a byproduct can be up at eight or 900. But we'd like to stay at the low end because that produces a better quality of biochar. And what happens when you put biochar in the soil? It builds soil structure. It has a low cation exchange capacity, so it actually reduces nutrient leaching. Soluble minerals in the soil that would be washed out are held on to if there's enough biochar in the soil. That means that fertilizer use can be reduced by up to 50% or more if you're using chemical fertilizers for organic farmers quite dramatic results. It helps soil retain moisture, both because of its porosity, but also because it acts as a refugia for mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria that work in harmony with plants in a healthy soil, and these populations shoot up. Like all life on Earth, uh, mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria have are, are mostly water, so all that life is also retaining water in the soil. When you have a high level of that kind of <coughs> friendly, if you like, fungal and bacteria activity in the soil, pathogenic bacteria and fungi find it much harder to reach the roots of the plant and cause the sort of plant diseases that we need, fungicides and various other chemicals to treat. And mycorrhizal fungi produce something called glomalin. It's a glycoprotein, a sticky substance, that helps aggregate soil. So when you have bits of gritty sand and clay and other things in soil, the glycoprotein, the glomalin, helps to agglomerate it to produce aggregation and good soil structure, which means that water and air in the soil are more evenly distributed in plants 
thrive in that sort of environment. Nitrous oxide emission. Soil is a major emitter, or a significant emitter of nitrous oxide. Biochar in soil reduces those emissions by up to 80%. So the result is more fertility, higher yields, and as a bonus, long-term carbon sequestration because biochar is a once-off addition. Once you've got the right level of biochar in the soil, you can forget about it. It stays there for 50, 100, in the case of some examples in the Amazon, thousands of years. Those are the theoretical benefits. How do we take this to market? At Carbon Gold, we're a for-profit business, and we've looked at various aspects of this. The first is, how do we get the production right? Making charcoal is a dirty business, high level of emissions. For every ton of wood you put in, you get about 10, 100 to 120 kilos of charcoal, which is like a 10 to 12% yield. We've developed a kiln that produces a 20 to 25% yield and a very dramatic reduction in emissions because we recycle the off-gases from the process and that's one of the reasons we get the higher yield. Uh, we've also made a larger version of that kiln where the heat from one kiln is directed to the next one so it accelerates the process so that you get a much, a much even higher level of efficiency. And we've done field trials. Um, this is a, a field in East Sussex where uh, rows of biochar were planted and uh, cabbages and uh, red mustard were, were, were put in. Unfortunately, biochar doesn't repel pigeons. That was uh, just before the pigeons came in and took it away. We've also done small-scale trials. Uh, Stephanie Donaldson of uh, Country Living did some trials with a biochar compost. Because the other thing we're trying to do with biochar is replace peat. Now, most peat is extracted and burned in power stations or as heat, but a significant amount does go into the gardening trade, and there's an attempt to drive that out. We've worked with a company called uh, Organic Plants, who raise 40 million plugs, vegetable plugs a year, and they have said that it performs as well as the peat based compost that is sort of the unhappy reality of organic production, that whilst organic farmers don't use peat, their seeds are propagated in peat-based composts because nothing else does the job as well. So we're finding routes to market for biochar. A company called Dynamotive in Canada worked with biochar on pasture, which is more than twice the amount of arable land on the Earth's surface. What they found is that with just four tons a hectare, less than four tons a hectare, applied once in 2007, every year to date they've seen a percentage increase in total biomass growth, double digits in the early years. The forage is superior nutritional quality, the cattle that eat that forage have higher levels of milk production, and all the time they're reducing greenhouse gas emissions. In Belize, where we still work with cocoa farmers. The um, farmers are reluctant to plant trees. It takes seven years for a cacao tree to bear its first fruit. Trees that were planted four years ago are fruiting and producing. That tree on the left has 26 pods, which has amazed farmers in that area because they've never seen anything like it before. Um, Kraft, who now own green and blacks, uh, have paid for 10 of those biochar kilns to go into farmers there, and they're using them to produce biochar for the new tree plantings. And in fact, the UNDP have just given the, uh, just agreed to give the cooperative $50,000 so they can buy more kilns and increase the use of biochar even further. In Belize, for us, it's a small country, 300,000 population, English speaking, it's a good test bed for us for tropical crops. So not only are we doing trials with cacao, which Kraft will extrapolate into their much larger production in the Dominican Republic, Ivory Coast, and Ghana, but we're also doing trials with banana growers and sugarcane growers in order to assess the 
benefits of biochar for those crop types. And we have an agreement with a company called Pine Lumber. Uh, is Belize also has a sustainable forestry industry. Every week they burn 20 tons of woody biomass at their extraction sites and another 10 tons at their sawmill sites. They're now converting that into biochar uh, in anticipation of supplying it to the sugarcane and banana growers who don't have the same kind of woody biomass feedstocks. At a consumer level, we've got a brand and a, a corporate brand and a product brand. The corporate brand is Carbon Gold, our product brand is Grochar. And we have our products in gar garden centers, in Waco's, and available online. We provide a, a compost, a seed compost, and what we call Grochar, which is biochar that's been inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi, actinomycetes bacteria, kelp so when you add it to the soil these fungi don't have to find it they're there in it and so they can get to work straight away unfortunately the garden center industry is on its knees at the moment and so we've been struggling slightly with them but our online sales are holding up the weather for the last five or six weeks has been very painful for them we have a lot of support the government is opposed to in trying to phase it out. In fact, their last voluntary target date was two years ago and they, nothing happened. So they're pushing hard now. Uh, we've been involved in a DEFRA consultancy consultation with the University of Edinburgh, which has the UK Biochar Research Centre, 12 PhD students working on different applications of biochar in different British agricultural situations. And Garden Organic have a demonstration plot in um, their demonstration garden in Brighton near Coventry using our Grochar products. And this is their I Don't Dig Peat campaign. We submitted a methodology several years ago to the Voluntary Carbon Standard to establish just how much carbon credit would be available if biochar was included in any carbon emission trading scheme. Uh, it became quite controversial with some people saying we were too soft and others saying we were too conservative. So we've left that, but in fact the Climate Trust have come out with a figure of 2.35 tons for every of carbon dioxide offset for every ton of biochar added to soil. The voluntary carbon standard have come uh, verified, they're now called, came up with three tons. We think if you make biochar efficiently enough, i.e. using one of our kilns, you're going to get twice as much yield and a much lower level of emissions, and this will work through into that ratio. Australia is introducing a carbon tax on July 1st of this year. Uh, the carbon farmers of Australia are getting quite excited about it. They're not going to tax agricultural emissions because that would drive up the price of food. But what they are going to do is reward farmers who help to reduce emissions. Uh, the floor price for carbon in Australia is going to be $23. It will go up to $24 next year and $24.50 the year after. They're giving the farmer, basically, they're accepting the three times ratio. So if a farmer puts a ton of biochar into a hectare of land, they will get $69, three units, three times $23. Because biochar encourages this boom in microbiological populations, the weight of carbon in those populations uh, qualifies them for a one-off payment for another two tons of carbon per hectare which is $46, and then they will get recurring payments, and I'm not sure of the exact figure, 23 is a guess, for the annual reduction in nitrous oxide emissions. And the farmers will benefit from lower irrigation costs, which is quite a significant cost in parts of Australia. It's benefit from lower input costs. Input costs are rising across the board, and they'll get increased yields. So that's the hope, but in any case, this is it's going to be a very interesting experiment because there's one country in the world where government policy
is now putting wind into the sails of the use of biochar in agriculture. A couple of years ago, Caroline Lucas invited me to give a presentation to the EU MEP Green Group. And a few people from DG Agri and DG Environment sat in on it. Um, I apologize in advance for the not very scientific nature of this slide, but the idea is what role can biochar play? How significant a contribution can it make to the global problem of uh, climate change? And I produced a slide for them that I call Fasting in Rags. And just hypothesized, what if nobody on the planet ate food for a year, and we didn't buy any new clothes, and we just took all the land we use for growing food crops and textiles, and implicitly biofuels as well, and laid, turned it over to the produ production of woody biomass, how much would it take? And these are very rough figures, but basically, to get back to 1850 levels of carbon dioxide, we need to take 56 billion tons of carbon out of the atmosphere. We have 11 billion hectares of farmland, pasture, scrub, and forest. If we just grew nothing but biomass and took out uh, 20 tons of biomass per hectare, and that's probably an optimistic figure, but we would end up with five tons of biochar, 55 billion tons of carbon. So we could do it roughly, and I emphasize very roughly, in one year. All right, so we could do it in 20 years if we just did it at two and a half percent a year. But that's the contribution the biochar could make. You've all heard of the Princeton wedge. We believe that biochar can be a wedge, one of those pieces of the jigsaw that will help us to do something about climate change. Nicholas Stern said, the greater the coordinated involvement of all emitters, the more successful, cheaper, and equitable are the actions and outcomes. When he says emitters, we would just like to add and mitigators and sequestrators, because we're all in this together, and it's not just about reducing emissions, there's only one way you can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere securely and store it in the soil securely, and that is not carbon capture and storage in coal-fired power stations, that is photosynthesis using a natural process that has been around longer than life on than human life on Earth, and converting it into biochar, which we know has a long-lasting and permanent benefit in the soil. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That, uh, speaking to somebody who has a garden, I'm going to be looking for your product. I could. <laughs> well, Dalesford, the, um, I don't know if you know the Dalesford shops in London, but Lady Bamford read about biochar 18 months, two years ago, and we started supplying her with material for her trials. They've switched over completely to biochar composts. They sell potted plants in their shops, and the waste levels have dropped because those plants stay fresh longer on the shelf than the ones they used with a peat-based compost. And all the vegetables that they grow now are grown in biochar. Yeah, fifth person over the last month who has asked that question. And I, I think the answer is yes. Um, it's because orchids depend very much on a biological system and biochar is ideal for any of that sort of system. In, in an industrial farming system, when you put chemical fertilizers into the soil, the plants no longer have the need mycorrhizal fungi or bacteria. The, the, the relationship, most plants will 15%, 10 to 15% of the carbohydrate they make in their leaves through photosynthesis exudes through their roots to feed mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria, which then ferry through long hi-fi tubules like little filaments 
in the soil nutrients to the plant. The minute you put chemical fertilizers on the soil, the plant has no need of mycorrhizal fungi. Why should I pay you for something that the farmer's giving me for free? And I'll use those nutrients to grow bigger and reproduce faster. So that the real benefits come from a, a more balanced natural farming system. But you still get the cation exchange, the other you know, leaching reduction, you still get benefits in a more industrial system. But for orchids, yes, I'd be interested to follow your progress. <laughs>